I think first year, 2019, May, all the way to like the start of COVID, that was a very tough year, especially because I had to juggle school. Didn't do a very good job juggling at the start. So I, I, I decided, let's just take the LA, go all in, 100%. That first year of difficulties really built the foundation of the company today in terms of how everything is run. So it, it was tough, but I think looking back, I enjoyed it. Like I consider myself a very process-driven person rather than an outcome-driven person. Welcome to Brave. Learn from Southeast Asia's best tech leaders. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. No BS on success. I'm Jeremy Al, venture capitalist, serial founder, Harvard MBA, sci-fi nerd, and dad of two daughters. Join our movement of over 12,000 members for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.bravesea.com. Do you manage your own IT for distributed teams in Asia? You know how painful it is. Asseville helps your in-house team by taking tough tasks off their hands and giving them the tools to manage IT effectively. Get help across eight countries in Asia Pacific, which includes onboarding, procurement, device management, real-time IT support, offboarding, and more. Gain full control of all your IT infrastructure in one place with our state-of-the-art platform. Check out Esevel, E-S-E-V-E-L dot com and get a demo today. Use our referral code BRAVE for three months free. Terms and conditions apply. Hey, Evan. Really excited to have you on the show. You know, I said something tremendous about you over watching you grow and build the company over the past one year and glad to be an angel investor in you. So we'd love for you to introduce yourself real quick. Yeah. Hi, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Okay. Quick introduction about myself. Hi, everyone. My name's Evan. I'm the founder and CEO of Zenith Education. So I started Zenith about three years ago, just as about I was to enter university. So it's been a pretty interesting last three years with COVID and like having to adapt online. So we've managed to grow in Zenith to become Singapore's largest university focused or pre-university focused education company. We currently serve about 15% of all students in Singapore in the high school market. And I guess it's, it's been a very interesting journey as a student entrepreneur. And I think most importantly, I had a lot of fun building it. So I'm happy to share today about my entire journey and experience up to today. Yeah, so very, very happy to be on the podcast today. So Evan, how did you first get sucked into entrepreneurship? Well, I think that was quite a while back. I think, okay, I think when I was very, very young, I was a bit of an entrepreneur already. So I think this is a quite interesting story whereby in primary school, right, I realized that a lot of people were like addicted to like making those like rubber band guns or like those like boomerangs with like ice cream sticks. So what I used to do was I used to go to the bookshop. I like, I bought every single packet of like ice cream sticks. Like literally there was no more. And then like, I'll go home. I'll like build the boomerangs. I'll build like the rubber band guns. And then I'll go to school and then I'll sell it for like an insanely marked up price. So like one boomerang, which is like four sticks I used to sell for like $2. And then like one rubber band gun would be like $10. So like basically because I bought out the entire bookshop, right? I had a monopoly. So I made a lot, a lot of money, I guess, at that time. Didn't really use it well. I, I reinvested everything into like, you know, Maple Story eCash. Had a gaming addiction when I was young. But yeah, I think that was my true taste of entrepreneurship for the first time. But I mean, it didn't work out because I think very soon people realized that why am I paying so much for like, like five ice cream sticks. I can just go to like popular and buy it myself. So, I mean, yeah. So I think that only lasted for like about three months before people caught on. Yeah, but I guess after like that childhood, right? I guess I was entrepreneurial throughout, tried a lot of different things. But in terms of like professional, I think right after junior college, I actually worked for an tech startup for about two months. I think that was a very interesting experience. Really made me fall in love with the entrepreneurship culture or like the startup scene. And I think from that moment onwards, like even though it was a short two months, I realized that entrepreneurship was something that I wanted to try. Like I didn't necessarily know I would like devote my life to it, but I knew like one day, like I always wanted to start my own business. And I guess I'm quite lucky that it came a lot sooner rather than later. 
And well, three months is quite a long time. I'll say to the monopoly is to be yeah. selling those <laughs> rubber guts. <laughs> I guess when you're a child, you're not a sophisticated buyer. So good Agreed. for you to, uh, you know, provide value and transaction yeah. for them, you know, they're too lazy to make their own, uh, rubber and guns. Yeah. Um, so obviously those were important experiences that you had. And what's interesting is that you became a founder in education pretty early, right? So yeah. before you started university. So why did you start wanting to build this education company? Yeah, I guess very early on, I, I asked myself like what kind of industries like I was very interested in. I think I settled with climate and education, mainly because I felt like these kind of industries were very impactful. And I, I guess early on in my life, I realized that I'm someone who's driven by purpose and impact. And I couldn't really do something unless there was a meaning to it. Lah. And I, I didn't know it was education that was going to be my path. It, it was just a case of I was exploring a lot in terms of different kind of industries. And I, I guess very early on in like 2017, I actually started teaching mainly just to pass the time. Like, I mean, the income was good, but I, I guess like while I was waiting for a national service to start, I was just a bit bored. So I, I, I tried it out and I realized that education actually ticked all the right boxes, right? Because number one is something that I enjoy doing, which is the most important in my opinion. Number two is something that is impactful, something the world needed. And number three, I think at the end of the day, it's something that I could make money off of. I, I think as a young adult, I think that's something very important as well. I, I had to choose a career whereby it is financially sound. So I guess it started ticking all the right boxes. And I realized that, you know what, after like one, two years of trying, this could really be a career path or this could really be the industry I wanted to focus in. And yeah, I think I just went through the entire process of two to three years or really in the industry itself before I realized that, okay, I can actually do this long term. So in a way, you could say that I realized it by accident, like just because I started teaching right before I went into army, I realized that I loved it a lot. So yeah, I think it, it was just a case of tried it, fell in love with it, and th this is me all the way, I guess. So what were your early days like in terms of uh, building this company? Zenith. Yeah, I, I didn't like if I were to go back to 2019, right? It was very tough. So even though like I say I'm a founder, right? I actually had a co-founder at the start. So the interesting story was I got accepted into UCL, dream school. I've been wanting to study in London my entire life. My co-founder got accepted into LSE. And I guess it was like April 2019, we agreed, you know what? Okay, let's stay in Singapore. Let's Practice this together. But I, I think it was May 2019 where he was like, you know what, I, I want to go to LSE. I think I can't pass on that kind of opportunity. Respected his decision, understood. Doing very well for himself right now, doing investment banking at JPM. So I, I guess like it, it wasn't a bad pathway he took. But I guess it was very tough because I was essentially a solo founder whereby I had to figure out everything myself. And I, I guess the good thing is like my past internships or like, just in doing it for the last two and a half years helped me to learn on a very basic level how to run a business in terms of operations, finance, like marketing, legal, even like sourcing for units. It, it was very overwhelming, I guess. I had to learn a lot of things at once. And I, I guess the good thing was the best way to learn is either by making mistakes or by finding mentors. I think early on, I didn't really have any like mentorship, at least for the first one and a half years. So it was really a time of making as many mistakes as I could. And having a win or learn mentality whereby best case scenario, it goes well, great. Worst case scenario, it doesn't go well, but I get to learn a lot from it. And then of course, in the future, I'm able to avoid all these mistakes that I'm making in the present. So yeah, I think first year, 2019, May, all the way to like the start of COVID, that was a very tough year, especially because I like, had to juggle school. Didn't do a very good job juggling at the start. In fact, like I, I still remember I went into university after like four weeks of lessons, I was like, you know what, I need to take an LOA. Like, I don't really feel like that I'm committing 100% to the business if like I'm spending like 20, 30% of my time on school. Right? So I, I, I decided let, let's just take the LOA, go all in 100%. Really spend the first year setting up the right foundation, setting up the right systems, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And I guess that first year of difficulties really built the foundation of the company today in terms of how everything is run. So it, it was tough, but I think looking back, I enjoyed it. Like, I think I really enjoyed it. Like, I consider myself a very process-driven person rather than an outcome-driven person in the sense that 
I enjoy the process more than I enjoy achieving the outcome. I, I think one of my favorite quotes recently is, the man who loves walking will go much further than the man who only loves the destination. So I guess it's a good thing as well as a founder that I enjoy the process of building more than just achieving the outcome. So it allows me to really like be able to persevere throughout all these like tough times. Uh. You mentioned mistakes that you were okay to make. So what were the mistakes that you made in those early years before you eventually went on to build a $6.7 million revenue startup <laughs> or during university yeah. years? So lots of success, right? But what were those early mistakes that you made? So I think the two that comes to mind immediately will be number one, equity. And number two, it will be a lot of unnecessary financial costs. So I think I didn't come from a finance background. I mean, now it, I, I'm a business student, so... Now, in a way, I do come from a finance background, but like previously, I didn't really know how to like manage my budget well. I didn't know how to allocate money. I didn't know how to do like forecasting. So I guess it was just a lot of experimentation and spending money on areas where I didn't need. So for example, when I opened my first outlet at Bona Vista, right, I was like going through like all the renovation costs. And then like, I still remember like I had two classrooms. I was like, you know what? It's a good idea. How about I have like a wall that can be like opened up just in case I want to like make it into a bigger classroom. So didn't really check a lot. I only went to like my one contractor and said, oh, can you quote me on that? And they said $9,000. And I was like, okay, that's a bit X. Like, you know what? Let's just do it. Till today, I have not used it a single time. Like it was just $9,000 burn. I mean, $9,000 today isn't that much. But like back then, it was like, I think 10% of like the money I put in. Because I, I still remember I saved up 100K, put it into the business account. That's all the money I had. And I spent $9,000 on like a door that like you can, uh, sorry, on a wall that can like open. So I guess I could be a lot more financially prudent. Like nowadays what we do is like, we'll get like quotes from like four or five different contractors. We have a very, very tedious decision-making process on every decision to avoid all of this. But I, I, I guess it's a $9,000 tuition fee that I, I had to pay in order to learn that, okay, when it comes to like these kind of things, I need to like source out for a lot of different quotes. I need to really figure out the feasibility of things rather than just spending it because my gut feel tells me I need to spend it. I think it was a good decision in the end because what happened was like each classroom was like 12 students, but then end up because of the high demand, right? We, we needed much bigger classrooms. So just because I could open up the wall, then we could do bigger classes. And yeah, from the get-go, we opened it up. We have never closed it up again. So I, I guess that was a painful decision that worked out. Yeah, so... Yeah, I, I can go on about all the other costs, right? But I guess it can also be intangible costs in terms of equity. Like, I think I, I actually saw a report from Qatar just yesterday, right? They, they actually showed like how much companies were giving on average for like your first or second employee. Like I saw like the range was like anywhere between like 0 0.3 to like 1.2% at the 90th percentile. So for me... I, I guess I was feeling a bit lonely, didn't really have anyone to talk to or bounce ideas. So brought in people to actually help. But I, I guess the people that I brought in didn't necessarily have the right business acumen, didn't necessarily bring the right value. And I gave out a lot more equity than I should have. Like I was giving out, I think for the first three or four people, like like five to 10% each. And I, I guess very, very quickly, I realized that these weren't the right people. And I mean, Founders or like even early stage employees, it's like a marriage, right? Like, um, if you get in bed with them, it's expensive if you want to ever like break apart. But I guess very, very fast, I realized that who was suitable, who were not. Managed to claw back the equity such that till today, I still, I still have a lot of equity in the company. But if I wasn't that lucky in terms of realizing early on that these people weren't the right people, I would be diluted a lot more than as compared to today. And I guess that's a lesson for a lot of like founders who are starting out their journey, right? And especially university students or like fresh graduates who are trying their hands in entrepreneurship. It, it, it feels good to have someone there and then you give them equity and they're like, okay, now they're invested in the business. Now they're my right-hand man. Now they'll go the entire journey with me. But I realize that more often than not, that's not the case. Uh, more often than not, it's not the case. It's actually, it, it, it takes a while for you to find the right person. And I guess I only really found the right partners two and a half, three years into running the business. I brought them in, gave them very, very good terms. And honestly, I, I see them contributing as much, if not more to me, to the business today. So I guess the lesson learned is be patient. It's a lot better to wait for the right person rather than trying to rush and find someone just because it feels good. It's kind of like a relationship. I mean, I have no experience about relationships. 
Oh, okay, but I, I guess it's quite similar in the aspect. Uh. And what's interesting is that obviously you made those mistakes as a freshman, right? And yep. renovation and talent choices. So what was it like to be a student and a founder at the same time? Were you, well, what choices did you have to make? What trade-offs did you have to make? Yeah, I, I guess here's the thing, right? I, I, I like to sometimes tell my friends who are like trying multiple things at once. If you're only giving like 50% to each of the things that you're trying, like if you're trying two things or even like, like 33% to everything, then how are you going to compete against someone who's giving a hundred percent? Someone who's already smarter than you, already more hardworking than you and giving their hundred percent. How are you going to compete? And I guess for me, I realized that if I don't give 100% to my company, then I'm not only doing myself an injustice, but I'm also doing all the people who are working with me or like who are a loyal customer or like a big like supporter of me and injustice. So I realized that, you know what? I think it was like middle of 2020 or early 2021 that I had to be like really 100% into the business. Like previously, I think it was like an 80-20 split in terms of 80% of the time on the business, 20% on school. I think 2021 onwards, it was like 99.9% business, 0.1% like school. So like, I, I still remember two and a half years, first class honors, like maintaining like a 4.7, 4.8. Then like 2001 came and then it just, like it just went all the way down. I mean, I'm still maintaining like a second upper. It's, it's good, but like as compared to before, it's, it's not as good. So I, I guess it's really a case of if you want to be a student entrepreneur, you know that you have to give 100% to the startup. If not, it won't work out. And I guess because it's, it's a startup environment, right? The chances are it won't work out. Like literally 90% of startups or more fail in, within the first year. And I don't want it to be a case whereby it fails and I say, you know what? It's because I didn't give my 100%. That's why it failed. And then I live with that regret. So nowadays, like whenever I do something, I have to like fully commit and really give my 100%. In order for me to know like the results, it is is because I gave my hundred percent, and if I failed, I like I don't regret it because I know that I gave it my all. Well, we go one level down. Obviously, in you know, a university is about hanging out, finding yourself, yeah, going to Zook, <laughs> uh, <laughs> finding a romantic partner. You know, those are the those are the things, right? So, yeah. would it? Can you share any moments where I, you remember like you made like. You wanted to go somewhere or do something, but you just chose to do the business instead. Wow. Um, hmm. Okay, so I don't think she'll ever see this. So I'm just going to say it. Okay, so in my first year of university, right, I think there was this girl that I was like mad obsessed about. I was very, very close to her. In fact, like all of my other friends, like no one knows about this like, particular girl. I, I kept it very quiet. Yeah, and like, I don't, I think in my entire like, life, right, I, I won't say that I've ever found the one, right? It's just people who like take all the right boxes. And I think I only think of like, like when what comes to mind is like three people who take all the right boxes, right? But for one reason or another, like it didn't work out. The other two is because they are, they are overseas, they are studying overseas or like working overseas right now. But this one girl, like, I, I felt like she's like my dream girl. Even like today, like, I look at the Instagram, like, damn, like, yeah, so because I remember just now I mentioned like I'm, I, I took the LA like very early on like I talked to her like I, I was like oh you want to explore something like like uh, I'm really into you and she's like oh yeah like like I want to try something but I went I, I decided that you know what I have to take the LA I had to be like fully focused on the business so I actually disappeared from school I was in hall I withdrew from hall as well I, I was literally I think working 120 130 hours a week on the business like it was tough. Like I, I, I remember I started every day at 8 a.m. I finished every day at like 3, 4 a.m. Seven days in a row. Like I, I literally did not stop. Every every single second was committed to the business. So because of that, like I cut contact with a lot of friends. I cut contact with a lot of people that I met at university. And yeah, so that particular girl, I, I didn't really talk to her anymore. And then like when I came back to school, I was like, hey, like you want to catch up? Like how are things? Then she, she had a new boyfriend already. And yeah, like, I, I guess that was a missed opportunity that I regret a lot. Like, sacrifices for the business, right? Trade-offs have to be made. I guess that is my biggest regret so far. And if you ask me why go back in time and do things differently, I think the answer is still no. Because, like, whatever I did in that first one year, like I said, was the foundation of who I am today and what the business is today. So, 
who knows, who knows? Maybe like, I mean, she's a dance right now, right? But maybe like down the road, we'll see, we'll see. But yeah, I guess that's one of the <laughs> sacrifices I made that I chose work over the university life. Yeah. Oh man. Never say never. You, have, you know, I met my now wife back during JC days. So long, 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 many, many years down the road. So never say never. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's a fair point, right? And I think that's actually, I mean, the truth is, is not just like relationships, right? But also, like you said, it's more like you're really focusing on the business and you had to sacrifice everything, right? Your own social life, your own yeah. networks. Also, you took a leave of absence. And so I think there are a lot of founders who are obviously students, right? Mm -hmm. Students who want to be founders. And they're like, oh, I have this dream to be a founder, but I'm scared, you know, what I have to do. So what, what's your brutal advice for them, I guess? I, I guess at the end of the day, the chances of you failing is exponentially higher than the chances of you succeeding. I, I believe there's a lot of survivor bias whereby if you look in the media and you see all these like successful Gen 1, Gen 2 founders from Singapore, like for example, you look at Carousel, you look at Shopback, you look at like Pet, PetSnap, like all these different like companies whereby like, wow, these guys like 10 years ago, they were just students and they made it today. Like I want to be like them, right? But the thing is for every one person that made it, there's another 99 that failed. And I guess as much as it's important as a founder to be very optimistic and be very, very confident in yourself, I feel like there must be a, a, a bit of uh, pragmatism whereby you need to be realistic with yourself. You need to do a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of validation in terms of what you're trying to build, in terms of is that even a market? Is the market big enough? Like, like is there even a chance that you're going to arrive at that product market fit and capture enough? money or your unique economics makes sense for you to be able to scale. Like the, most of the time when I hear a lot of ideas from other like potential founders, right? Like, I mean, I don't say, I, I'm always like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Like you can go try. But in my head, I'm like, will the unique economics really make sense? Re really, really go the distance? Like, I don't really think so. But like, I don't want to like crush their dreams. I say, you know what? There's no harm trying. Like what I know is what I know, right? Like I, I, I don't know more than what I know. So like maybe there's a market out there. So I, I guess you need to be really comfortable with failure. And I guess when I look at a lot of the different student entrepreneurs or even those like that graduated like one, one generation above me in terms of those who are doing well, I think a common trait that I see is that a lot of them are comfortable in discomfort in the sense that you must be okay putting yourself out there. You must be okay with failure. You must be okay feeling very awkward at times, right? But it's a necessary trait that you must have in order to succeed. Because if you're not willing to put yourself in an uncomfortable position, if you're not willing to make those decisions that m might be the right decision but might not feel the best, I don't think that you'll necessarily do well in this startup environment, especially in this market of all times. It sounds like these are also learnings that you made yourself, right? Yep. And I remember you and I, in our first conversation, you were having some debate about how big you want that vision to be, right? Yeah. And the economics of the business and we work through that. So what have been some learnings as you've gone through, I think, as you transition from, like you said, from a teaching towards more of a startup mindset and that growth mindset, what have been some learnings that you've personally had? Yeah, I guess when I, oh, wait, I think the last one year of really putting myself into, let's just say the fundraising in the VC scene, I probably learned a lot more in the last one year than I would say like the previous few years. I think ultimately when I was in my own little pond, like because technically like what I've built is more traditional in the sense that it's, it's a business that has been around for like the last 20, 30 years. We're not particularly innovative in terms of the core business. And I, I guess when I started to think about the startup, or at least the tech side that I'm building right now, like I, I felt that I had very, very big vision, a lot of different ideas about what will work in the market. But I guess it was only when I went to talk like VCs, when I talked to people on the ground, when I realized that there's a lot of flaws, there's a lot of holes, there's a lot of different perspectives that is very, very invaluable. In fact, like when I look at like maybe like the top three different advice sets I got over the last one year, I will say that two of it came from like talking to like GPs of like top tier VCs. Last one came from a mentor that, that has been meeting up with me like once every two weeks. So I, I guess 
as startup founder, right, is I, I feel like the number one lesson I've learned is that it's very, very important to seek advice wherever you can, like literally like under the bridge, like open up a dumpster and look inside, like anywhere you can find advice, anywhere you can get more opinions. It's always good to get more perspectives and opinions on how things should be done, especially from people who have been doing it a lot longer from you. I, I think ultimately, like if I did not like go to LinkedIn and reach out to people, if I didn't go for networking events and, and talk to like analysts or associates or VPs at VCs, or if I didn't even go for like, like these startup networking events where I talk to other founders, there's a lot of things that I know today that I would not know. And even like, even though like today in this uh, day and age, right, Google has like everything, like, like you don't know what you don't know. So it's just a case of meet as many people as you can, absorb as much information as you can. In fact, I I'll say that a lot of what I'm building and a lot of the strategy that I'm doing is actually inspired by other founders in the startup space, in, in different industries that I realized, hey, th like that works for that particular industry, right? Why don't like I experiment and think about it in my industry? And yeah, so I, I think the number one lesson I've learned is in order to learn, you must really put yourself out there. You must really seek out as many mentors, as many advisors, as many friends and people going down the same path as you can in order to absorb and learn as much as you can. And yeah, I, I guess it's been very rewarding. I, I would say that if, if I never took that leap of faith and really put myself in that position of discomfort, which I, which I mentioned just now as a necessary trait, right? I would have never grown to become the person I am today. Lah. So I, I guess number one lesson is really don't be paisay to reach out. I think what I've observed about the Singapore or even the Southeast Asia startup VC ecosystem is that people are very, very willing to help even though they might not get anything in return. Like I, I can create an entire list uh, of people that literally have no benefit from helping me, yet they actively reach out, actively send leads, actively give advice whenever possible just because I reached out to them, they, they like what I'm building, they support the vision. And yeah, I feel like it's very, very important that if you're a founder, you, you better start networking, you better start talking to as many people as you can because of the, the sheer amount of knowledge and information that you're able to gain from all these different opportunities. And what's interesting is that you've obviously started to think through the mission mm -hmm. and your, your principles, as you, as you said, build this startup. So what do you, looking forward, what do you think are the major principles and mission that you want to kind of like build the next stage for? Yep. So I guess originally when I started the company, right, mission statement, very clear cut. In fact, it was very simple. It was just to help students to reach their peak potential. I feel like even in Singapore, right, there's a lot of students that could benefit a lot from getting a world-class education that is holistic, that is really different from the public education sector. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that the public education sector is bad. In fact, I believe that Singapore probably has the best public education sector in the world by far. Country, some countries come close, but I, I do believe that just the fact that if you stay in Singapore, you will get a good quality education. But I think originally I felt that I could help students a lot more. Like, I mean, fundamentally, we offer test prep services, right? So looking at it from a very simple point of view, these students have the potential to get an A. Right, but they end up getting like a B or even a C just because they don't have the right guidance. And then end up just because of that B or that C, they don't get to go to that dream course or that dream school or they don't get to get a scholarship. And I, I guess that has been the very rewarding part for me when I started early on, right? When like I had so many parents calling me, oh, my son got an A for like these two subjects. Like they are now on this scholarship. Like you don't know how much that means financially to my family. Like, like sometimes because... Like the, the job is tough, right? Sometimes I'll go to 2019, 2020, I'll scroll through those old text messages and it gives me a lot of motivation to like continue doing what I'm doing because I know that I'm making material impact, tangible impact on the lives of the people that we work with and work for. But I, I guess it was late 2021, early 2022 that I realized that that couldn't be it. That couldn't just be it what I wanted because how I like to measure my own success is in terms of scale of impact. And I feel like it's a very easy formula. It's just how many people you can help multiplied by the extent you help each individual. And when I look at the 2,000, 3,000 students that I help every single year in Singapore, 
I guess the problem I had with myself was at the end of the day, I'm helping only two to 3,000 students. Even as I achieve my Singapore targets, maybe by 2027, I'm helping 25, 30,000 students in Singapore. That's give or take like about 15% of all students across all age levels. I'm helping 30,000 students. How much am I really helping them? Because a lot of them probably will have gotten their A's either way, correct? A lot of students come to us not just to get an A, but it's more about helping them be a lot more confident, helping them have a lot more convenience because I settle so much of the work for them. I, in a way, I don't really like to say this, but we spoon feed the students a bit in terms of like all the resources, right? Anytime they need help, they can contact us. We help them as much as we can. It's about really being customer obsessed, providing as much value as possible. But the thing is, a lot of them will still go to university, will still create better lives for themselves and their families. So I wasn't really satisfied in terms of that being the end goal. So I guess the North Star I have today, right? It's really about taking that world-class education we have in Singapore, making it affordable and accessible to all students in Southeast Asia as a start point and eventually globally. I, I think like a lot of different companies are trying to democratize education, which I don't see them necessarily as competitors, but I see them more of like people with the same mission, just doing it in a different way. But I guess how the mission has evolved is that I realized that I have something very, very good here in Singapore. And I really just want to distribute it to the rest of Southeast Asia. I like to believe that education is the most powerful industry in the world. Because when I talk about impactful industries, right? Healthcare, agriculture, pharmaceuticals, like even personal finance, right? These industries are important in helping you to survive. But when we talk about what kind of industries help you to thrive, it's education. So I, I feel like with the position I am in today, there's a lot more I can do in terms of democratizing it. In fact, like when I was growing up, right? I, I think I've told you this story before. I used to like, like watch the news, like do a lot of Google searches and I see all these like politicians, like when there's so many problems like corruption, pollution, income inequality, like there's so many problems in the world, yet how many people are really doing anything about it, correct? Like they are in a position of power, they're in a position of wealth, they can do something about it. And when I was growing up, I used to say, you know what, when I'm 45, when I have the wealth, when I have the network, when I have the experience, I'm going to do something about it. I'm not going to be like them. But then I realized like in 2022, right? Like I'm 23, okay, right? I have the wealth enough to survive. I have the network. I have the experience. I can do something about it. So if I don't at least try, not only does that make me a bit of a hypocrite, but I'm also doing society and injustice. So I decided early on last year, you know what? Let's think big. Let's go as ambitious as I can. Let's figure out how can we democratize education while still being profitable, while still being sustainable, while still being effective. Correct. And yeah, so I think that has been a very, very big change in terms of my mentality as compared to pre-2022 and 2021 in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And yeah, I think I just spent the last one year figuring out what idea, like what exactly works, building a team. Yeah, so literally my first official hire for like the tech side was July 2022. So I got ex MOE teacher who was part of the founding team of one of the largest startups in Myanmar in ad tech to actually be my first employee. Since then, we have, I think right now the team for the tech side alone is about 55 to 60 people. We've managed to grow very fast. In fact, we have outgrown our office. Yeah, but what I like is that everyone that we have, I have personally recruited is very aligned with this bigger mission of trying to take whatever we have in Singapore and just distributing it to the rest of the world. Yeah, so very, very big difference as compared to like what I originally built. You share about the power of education. So yeah. why does that mean this to you? Yeah, I guess to answer it very simply, right? If, if you trace it backwards, like right? if you want to have a decent income, you need to get a good job. If you need to get a good job, you need to have like a degree or like a good quality education in order to get to that point. So I guess when I talk about the power of education, it's really a case of it enables people to eventually go down that path whereby they can eventually create a better future for themselves. So I always like to say that I'm not trying to change the system. I'm just trying to level the playing field. 
Like, I mean, if you think about Southeast Asia, right? Give or take 700 plus million people. Like, that is the same amount of people that existed in the late 19th century. And if you look at the late 19th century, like, there's so many influential figures or there's so many, like, talented individuals that basically paved the way for the modern civilization today out of that 700 million people. And, like, if you look today, 700 million people in Southeast Asia, like, there's definitely the next Einstein, there's definitely the next Picasso, there's definitely the next influential figure who's going to pave the way for future generations as well. And the fact is, because they don't have these opportunities, they're never really going to have the ability to achieve what they could have achieved if they were given these opportunities. So I guess in a way, like, I don't only see that my impact in terms of education is that I'm able to help this generation get a good education, hence get a good job, hence create a better future. But I also see it as a very, very big multiplier effect whereby every single individual I'm able to help is able to then create a lot of impact on the people after them. So I think that's the really the power of education, right? That it's a multiplying effect, that it's widespread, that it's significant. And I think that's what just makes me very in love with it. And I, I find it very hard for me to ever go into any other industry just because I have a taste of how impactful education can be. When have you personally been brave? Yeah, I think when I look back at my entire life, right? Like, what was the one biggest decision I made that was very brave? I go back all the way to like my second year of junior college, right? Back then, I was 17. Something that I don't share, I think even at all, right? Even Only my friends like all the way back from my like secondary school or junior college know this about me, is that when I was growing up, I had a lot of uh, issues with mental health. Right? In fact, like second year of JC, like, I was diagnosed with like a clinical depression and it, it was a rough period for me. And then like a lot of people ask like, what, what led you to that situation, right? It's actually related to a lot of the things I said today. It was a case of, I didn't have a purpose in life. I didn't really find fulfillment. I, I didn't know what was my meaning of living. Right? And I think that was a very tough time because I, I didn't know what was the reason to live per se. Like. So like, even though like my first year of junior college, it, straight A's and B's, doing very well for myself, I think it was like March 2015, correct? Even though I was doing very well in school, I actually went to my parents and said, you know what, I want to take a gap year. I want to actually choose to retain in order to really take the year to understand myself. And I, I guess it, it was very weird for like my teachers and for like my parents to hear this, right? Because it's like literally like, literally doing so well. I was a, I was in two CCAs, like doing well, like in all aspects of like junior college, right? But I told myself, I don't want to just run the rat race. I don't want to just go through that motion of that typical Singaporean lifestyle and, and journey, right? Finish junior college, go to army, go to a good university course, get a job in finance. Like I was on that IB, like sales and trading kind of route that I, that I thought of like when I was in JC, right? Because I always enjoyed finance to a certain degree. So I didn't just want to run through that motion without knowing who I was, without realizing who Evan Hing is. So I don't get me here. It was quite crazy. Like a lot of people around me didn't really understand why I did it. A lot of rumors, a lot of people saying different stuff had to put up with it. And did I really discover myself in that one year? Not really. I, I, I think I got a better understanding of who I was. I, I would say that I only truly discovered myself when I was in army, I think that two years whereby we really had a lot of time to sit there and reflect. I, I tore my hamstring and injured my knee right before I went into army. So I was past C, right? So I had a lot of time to really, as an ASA, like uh, admin support assistant, right? To really figure out what I wanted to do in life. Yeah, so I, I figured out myself a bit later on. But I guess it was that decision in 2015 that really put myself on a very, very different path that I would have eventually gone on, right? If I didn't make that decision, right, I, I, I would say that right now I'll probably be in finance or be a lawyer because that, that was originally the path I was planning to take, right? And I, I, my, one of my partners, his, his name is Joel. He, he's one of my product managers, very talented guy. He has this saying that he likes a lot, which is two roads diverge, sorry, two roads diverge in the wood and I took the one less traveled by and that made all the difference in his life. I think, I think that's a quote that he likes a lot by... 
Robert Frost, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think back then my mentality was one year, like seems like a lot of time, but it's 1% of your life to make sure that the other 99% of your life goes the way that it should be. And I guess a lot of people thought that it was a bit dumb. In fact, like, one thing I like to joke is I'm the first ever two times JC Honors Row student for the promo exams because no one takes it twice, right? So I'm the only first time, sorry, I'm the only one with getting Honors Row twice. Like, it, it was a crazy decision, but I realized that the person I am today, it's just because of that one crazy decision I made as a 17-year-old back in JC. La. So I, I think that was the bravest decision I ever made. And it made me the person I am today. La. Yeah. If you could travel back to that time, right? When you were in J2, right? When yeah. you decided to retain yourself an additional year. Yeah. Sorry, at J1, actually. Yeah. So you get, yes, with J3, right? So this, you're J1 again. Your second time yeah. doing J1. Yeah. If you could travel back in time, a time machine, you could step out of the time machine and catch coffee with your younger self. Yeah. What advice would you give yourself? I think today I would consider myself like optimist, right? I think any founder must be a optimist in order to grow the business. But when I look back in time, every single part of my life that I would consider dark, correct, once again, push me on the path I am today, right? I think beyond just that, that difficulties in junior college, like in army, right, I, I was very miserable because I was injured. I had a slip disc in my neck. I had a torn hamstring. I had a jaw misalignment. It's called temporal mandibular joint disorder. It was very bad. I spent a lot of money trying to fix that. That was another dark time in my life. And then if I go in like maybe my first one, two years of army, like COVID, like having to manage the business. And I mean, definitely if you had a lot more time, I can share a lot more stories about the issues I had building. Okay. Mainly, I, I guess it's, it's really about people, right? It's like there were a lot of times where it was very rough. And, but I realized that it was because of those times, it like once again, it, it made me make the decisions that brought me on the right path. And if I were to go back in time to get to the point, if I were to go back to time, in time and talk to that 16, 17 year old version of me, I would tell myself that life isn't a straight line upwards, right? There's a lot of peaks and troughs. Like it's going up, it's going down, it's going up, it's going down. And it's, it's going down sometimes that is necessary in order for you to go much, much higher. And it's very important that during all these times, like, it's definitely going to be very difficult, but always approach these kind of situations or these kind of circumstances or these, or these kind of moments in life with optimism and really figure out how can you learn from it? How can you actually take away lessons from it? How can you actually grow as an individual from it rather than just being like very emo, emo, like just very sad through all these circumstances? Like, um... 16-year-old me probably won't really be able to appreciate this kind of advice. Right? I think me back then was a lot more much of a pessimist as compared to today. But I think definitely, like, I won't really say advice per se, but it's really just a, like, hits up. Like, life's going to hit you hard, right? But it's, it's a necessary process. And even though it might not be very comfortable, right? Enjoy it. Learn from it. And I think you'll be proud of the person that you eventually become six, seven years to get on. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, all of that. So I'd love to summarize the three big themes I got from this. The first, of course, thank you so much for sharing. I think the journey of how you got hooked on entrepreneurship at primary school. I love the story yeah. of you buying out this primary school bookstore to buy out all the ice cream sticks and sell them at a, like you said, ridiculous markup for three months. And that's your starting journey, but also your seed crystal for you later on building a $6.7 million revenue startup during university years, right? So I thought it was a very tremendous, I think, experience where you got to show I think, the arc of how uh, you became an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I love the quote here that you said here about the man who loves walking will get much further than the man who loves the destination. The second I really enjoyed was you sharing about how you had to be 99.9% .9 focused as a student founder. So I think you shared about how you made expensive mistakes as a freshman for renovations and talent choices during the early days. So you talk about how focus lets you compete with everybody else, right? Especially people who are full-time. And to some extent, you shared how that actually played out, right? You sacrifice your friendships, you sacrifice your time in hall, and sacrifice your first love there. So 
but I think thank you for sharing because I think people kind of gloss over the fact that there are trade offs, right? Yeah. And obviously, I also appreciate your advice about telling folks to never be embarrassed to seek advice from everyone and that life isn't a straight line going outwards. Lastly, I appreciate you sharing about the power of education. I think your sense of mission and how you've evolved the mission over the years has really changed and evolved, but it still shines true in the conversation. I thought actually there were some interesting moments along the way, right? Because you shared about your own education as a founder. You shared about how you've learned from talking to VCs and other folks and how you can get better. You talked about mistakes you've made. You talked about how you overcame teenage clinical depression. You talked about how you decided to repeat a year of junior college and how that would later feed into you deciding to teach junior college yourself. Yeah. So I thought there's some really interesting experiences where you, know, you even got injured right during army days and how those tough times helped you rebound into a stronger self of yourself. So thank you so much for coming on Brave. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the podcast with your friends and colleagues. We would also appreciate you leaving a rating or review. Head over to www.bravesea.com for member content, resources, and community. Stay well and stay brave. Thank you.